One of the most unique aspects of Warhammer 40k is the otherworldly and terrifying dimension known as the Warp. It is a parallel universe to real space, but at the same time, it's unbound to the laws that govern our reality. It is a dimension made up of pure psychic energy and the home to the unfathomable horrors known as the Chaos God. These four all-powerful beings have carved out their own twisted realms within the Immaterium, each one a reflection of the unique emotions they represent. You have the paradise of temptation and hedonism within Slaanesh's realm, you have the decaying gardens of Nurgle, the twisting and ever-shifting domains of Zinch, and finally the brutish and blood-filled lands of Khorne. And that's what we're going to talk about today in another episode of 40 Facts About the 40k Universe. If you're new to the channel, allow me to introduce myself. I am your host, Gersh1, your guide through the grim dark universe of Warhammer 40,000. If you guys like this type of content, don't forget to subscribe to the channel, hit the like button, and share with your friends. If you really want to see us create more lore videos like this, consider helping us out either on Patreon, the link is down in the description below. If not, giving us a super thanks really helps out the channel. But with all that said, let's get into 40 facts and lore on the realms of the four chaos gods. Let's begin by taking a look at the youngest chaos god's realm, Slanash. Found within the turbulent maelstrom of the warp is what Imperial savants call the Palace of Slanash, a realm created and maintained by the Prince of Pleasure himself. But unlike the other realms ruled over by the opposing Chaos Gods, Slanesh's domain is open to any being who wishes to visit the Lord of Access. Imperial preachers and cardinals use stories taken from eyewitness descriptions of the Palace of Slanash as a way to warn the Imperial public about the dangers of temptation. These tales of the palace may be based on real experiences, or may be pure and mad ravings brought on by fever or drugs, but real or imagined, they are powerful tales protecting the simple-minded from dreams of uncontrolled access that corrupts the mind. The stories always describe the prince's domain as a welcoming palace that sits at the center of the Chaos God's territory. It is surrounded by six distinct domains arranged in concentric rings each holding different temptations for those who dare wander through the Dark Prince's realm. In each ring, temptation is used as a weapon more powerful than a chainsword or bolter. The goal of Slaanesh's home is to consume the weak and the dim. The bodies of those who succumb to the temptations of the Dark Prince's realm are consumed by the land itself or turned into statues that beautify the view for others. The souls of these lost and damned unfortunates feed Slaanesh's insatiable hunger. He invites them in so that they might sustain him and his realm. Those who pass early tests may catch Slaanesh's eye, giving him some amusement for a time as he watches them resist, only to inevitably lose themselves to one seduction or another. Those rare few who have made it to the outer walls of the Palace of Pleasure may be graced by the visit of the Lord of Excess himself. None have ever made it into the palace itself unless Slaanesh wishes it, for all who have looked upon his perfection have fallen to their knees and given themselves over, mind, body, and soul, to this dark magistry. The first of Slaanesh's treacherous domains is the Realm of Excess of Riches, a place that confronts visitors with spectacles of riches beyond their wildest dreams. They tell of trees, grass, and other plants made from living gold. Gentle breezes cause the grass to shimmer like the waters of an ocean under a noon sun. As the wind passes over the blades of grass and through the branches and leaves of the trees, it takes on a voice that beckons all to take as much as they want and more. The mountains that rise up on the horizon reflect a glorious warm light, letting all who see them know that they too are formed from gold. Pathways from the fields are paved with cobblestones, not of granite and shale, but of ruby and emerald. At the edge of the path, loose gemstones and gold nuggets sit waiting for anyone to pick them up and slip them into their pouch. Wandering souls ensnared by this domain would do well to recall the legends that say if those who lined their pockets with these treasures were able to take their eyes off the objects of their desire, they would note that not all they see was shining. Dull bits of bone and other remains are plentiful here. These are all that is left of those who filled their pockets, pouches, sleeves, and boots with so much gold that they collapse under the weight of it. Unwilling or unable to let the riches go, they died where they fell, smiles on their faces despite their impending ends. If an intruder is able to pass through the golden fields without succumbing to greed, he is next confronted with a lake so vast its shorelines fade to nothingness in the distance. 
The only other land to be seen is a smattering of pale islands, connected to each other by a network of bridges. The finest wine serves as water in these lakes, but no cups wait to be filled. The bouquet of wine is strong, pleasant, and enticing. Words from fiery sermons begin to fade in the face of such serenity. Most visitors take very little time before they give up on the idea of cups and fall to their knees to drink directly from the lake. Head swimming with delightful intoxication, many continue to drink until they slip into the water and sink below the surface, never to be seen from again. Those who are able to lift their heads from the wine cast their gaze more closely to the islands and see them for what they are. Hunched giants holding a loaf, great tables heaped with extravagant feasts. Exotic fruits, rich bread, and meat of every kind are present. Swimming to these islands is perilous, and many who sense they become wine intoxicated sink beneath the waves, joining the countless others who have slipped beneath the carmine liquid. For the ones that make it, the reward is astonishing. Each bite is better than the finest meal they have ever experienced. Each morsel is a decadent delight for the tongue. Faster and faster, the wayward consume the food. The voracious eaters force handful after handful down their throats. In his blinding need to consume, he does not notice that some of the meat comes from carcasses with all too familiar forms. Even if he were to somehow stop forcing food into his own stomach long enough to recognize the fate that awaits him, he could not stop. Given completely over to gluttonous indulgence, the mortal only stops eating when his body fails and he finally collapses into the feast, awaiting for the next hungry diner. For those that survived the second ring, legends say that the Dark Prince filled his third ring of his domain with visions, scents, and experiences that overload the mind and body of anyone who makes it this far. Rich fields of pleasing textured grasses fill the ring, lit with teasing gold hues. Soft tents made of spun dream thread reflect visions gleaning from the deep subconscious of those who gaze upon them, forming corridors so narrow that a traveler cannot help but brush up against them and feel their cloying embrace. From one vista to the next, visitors travel through a series of decadent paintings, each more twisted and inviting than the last. Savants know this ring as the excess of bodily delight crude flesh dens of the underhives, or the elegant shadowed parters of the spires cannot present anything close to what the Lord of Endless Delight offers. Demon and mortal bodies entwine until they become one. Forms so beautiful, they are difficult to look at. Resistance is all but impossible. The sights and sounds of the offered pleasures are sufficient to enthrall most who see and hear them. The assault on these senses does not end with these things. The air hangs heavy with intoxicating musk, so rich and pervasive that it penetrates the flesh of all those who pass through it, quickening the heart and opening the senses further than thought possible. Thus stimulated, flesh becomes hypersensitive to even the most gentle breath of air or tender caress. A mortal in this state is easy prey for the purveyors of delight that surround them. Closing in on their now willing victims, demonettes offer comfort with soft, voluptuous flesh kisses with razor fang mouths, and embraces from piercing claws. If a mortal is able to overcome his cardinal instincts, he moves on to the next ring, the ring of excess of adoration. For each visitor here, the experience is unique, though there are many commonalities. Mass throngs may greet a soldier, cheering his name and erecting statues in his honor. Planetary governors may see themselves establishing such complete order that they gain control of an entire system. Whatever the scenario present to him, the victim of these visions finds it incredibly difficult to pull himself out of the dream. Unlike the dreams experienced when a person sleeps, these illusions do nothing to seem impossible. As soldiers have seen others elevated and have been trained to act for glory, history is filled with tales of governors who have carved out great realms among the stars. These and more offer solidity to the visions encountered drawing the dreamer further and further into illusionary depths. Only self-doubt gnaws at some, and these are the ones that break free. When they do so, the dream shatters, revealing, if only for an instant, a vast plain of black sludge. Upon it, heaps of bones are buried beneath the bodies of millions of others, standing and lying in the burned ash, 
still trapped in their own individual delusion. The unsettling image flashes by in an instant, and the traveler is confronted by the traps of the next circle. This next ring is the Ring of Access of Achievement. It appears to be a grand forest with dense clusters of majestic trees that house secluded open areas known as glades. The sound baffling effects of the trees put the mind in an introspective position. The long walk gives it time to wander. The glades are inviting and serene. In the center of each glade is a perfectly still pool that invites the traveler to sit and reflect upon his thoughts. As he stares into the pool, he recalls his accomplishments and dwells on what more he could achieve. Sitting there, lost in thought, the undergrowth of the glade begins to creep in on him. Thorny branches reach towards him, staggering vines descend from the trees, gently coiling around his neck. As he closes his eyes and imagines himself striking down legendary foes, conquering galaxy-spanning civilizations, or negotiating heavily favored warrants of trade, the water of the pool rises up and takes the shape of whatever represents defeat for the dreamer. Sensing something is amiss, the ensnared visitor opens his eyes and is confronted by a vision of shame and defeat, just before the branches of the vines rip off his flesh and choke the air from his lungs. The sound of his final scream, striffled by the lack of air, is a delight for the prince of painful raptures. An incredibly small number of travelers resist the temptation to dream, and are spared the torment of confronting their failings. They rise exhausted by their trials, and pass into the sixth and final realm that stands between them and the palace of pleasure. Upon emerging from the delightful torment of the previous five domains, Anyone who could resist the seduction placed before them at this point would surely become legend. This is the ring of access of repose. Awaiting the beleaguered travelers is a vision of sublime peace. All struggle is surely a thing of the past. All torment a distant memory. Here is a beach of softest sand, warm by the rays of a golden sun. Gentle breezes push scattered clouds through the perfectly blue sky. Music is carried on those same breezes, soothing the spirit. The ground itself rises up and caresses the body of the weaver wanderer. Share rooms begin to remove armor plates and burdenous belongings, coalescing from the salted mists of the waves that break on the shore. Figures with placid features and soothing hands approach and rub tired muscles. The memories of the arduous journey fade into nothingness. Peace is the wanderers at last. It is peace eternal if the will is not strong enough to snap consciousness back to reality. Determination sends the placid apparition screaming back to the sea. Resolve collects the displaced armor and other possessions. Herculean efforts forces the few strongest invaders to rise up and approach the final destination. The palace of pleasure lies ahead. Surely, any who could pass through the six trials is prepared for what awaits. A determined warrior, demon or mortal, who survived the predations of the six circles and their inhabitants, would naturally assume that the Palace of Pleasure, Slaanesh's residence and seat of power, would be defended with legions of demonettes and fiends. Surely, his keeper of secrets would confront any invader that made its way to the Dark Prince's abode. Thick walls must surround the grounds and towers of his great dominion. Slanesh has no need for such defenses. Any invading force, from a lone space marine to the legions of bloodletters, would find that the only guardians present would be statues of the finest alabaster and perfectly shaped trees. Confused as these warriors might be, nothing could prepare them for the presence of the master of the realm. As the invaders contemplate what they perceived as a lack of defenses, the air stills. Unseen choirs sing, and ears weep at the unholy harmonies. A god emerges from his palace, striding confidently towards the awestruck invaders. The Dark Prince smiles. It is enough to completely disarm any who stand in his presence. They are lost, and they care little of the fact. This, the tale says, is why there are no defensive walls or demonic cords. There is simply no need, resistance, in the face of perfection is not a possibility. What becomes of those thus ensnared is beyond speculation and more the subject of fevered dreams. 
Not one soul has trotted upon the grounds of the Palace of Pleasure and returned to tell the tale. Scholars of the obscene and decadent debate not only on the fate of those who get this far, but even the very structure of the grounds in the palace itself. There being no first-hand accounts, who can say for sure what form the citadel takes? Some say the palace is a single humble dwelling, making the appearance of the Lord of Obsession even more grand in comparison. Others say it is the most opulent structure ever conceived, stretching for kilometers in every direction, including upward. Most agree that it must be magnificent. A god of access and perfection must have a home to match. If this is correct, then the spires of gold and marble surely ring an inner courtyard wherein statues of exquisite realism are placed. These statues might be the final form of those who succumb to the disarming allure of Slanesh. If so, then their faces would bear absolute joy. These statues would capture forever the perfect moment of grace that one would surely feel in the presence of perfection. It may be that the only inhabitants of the Palace of Pleasure is Slanesh himself. Perhaps no demons of any kind are required to embellish the inner sanctum. Or it may be that the palace is filled with life, a den of inquity where decadence unrivaled is played out eternally. Regardless, it is the seat of power for the Lord of Pleasure, the master of painful delight, the god of obsession. It is home to Slanesh. Now let's move on to the Gardens of Nurgle. Like a normal garden, the domain of Nurgle is home to a bewildering array of flora and fauna, all interconnected and supporting the whole. Beds of bright blue shovel petal plants dig themselves up and leave the dirt in which they grew so that plague bearers can plant new skull seeds in their rich loam. As the skull seeds grow and blossom, they attract bounding, stomping, over-exuberant beasts of Nurgle that mistake their fruits for the heads of new playthings. This scatters their matter violently into the air where it comes to rest on the wings of the ubiquitous rot flies. Slowed by the sticky pulp of the splattered plants, these insects become easy prey for other flying creatures that ingest them as they soar through the rot-choked air. Unbeknownst to the predators, blot flies are carriers of many of Nurgle's experimental diseases and other creations. With their innards thus infected, these predators sicken, vomiting the contents of their guts all across the garden as they fly about, and eventually explode in showers of life-giving flesh and blood. This bounty of mutated and mutilated tissue falls into new areas of the garden beneath, decaying into compost and starting the cycle of life and death anew. Though the Garden of Nurgle does share certain commonalities with the gardens and jungles on planets in real space, it's still not a worldly garden in any sane sense. A visitor in this bizarre and perilous realm doesn't walk from place to place, they experience what needs to be experienced. Even the demons that tend to the garden are not really what might be thought of as a workforce that arrives at a place, does a job, and leaves. These demons are a part of the experience of the Garden of Nurgle itself. This is especially troublesome for the plague bearers, whose metamorphosized minds were once mortals and still strive to impose some type of reality in this unreal existence. Still, even the plague bearers accept their place in the garden and spend their eternity enjoying all it has to offer. Just another example how the plague father affords all his children the many ways to explore and appreciate his realm, and even to become part of it. Though he is a god of chaos, he also has a need to create order, to monitor his creations, and to control his experiments. A visitor to Nurgle's realm would find a dizzying amount of diversity of experiences. Here they might find a tree made out of nothing but the flesh of Eldari, constantly oozing the tears of a dying race. There they might find fields where tongues sprout out from the earth, each one blistered by a new influence of a different infection. There is no telling what wonders await around each bend in the path that stretches and winds throughout the gardens of Nurgle, but any who encounter them will surely have their sanities tested and questioned. While the mortal realm is laid waste by blight and pestilence, the lands of Nurgle and the realm of chaos thrive on disease and corruption. Tended by the Lord of Decay, this unwholesome realm is home to every pox and affliction imaginable, and its foe tied with a stench of rot. Twisted, rotten bout entangles with grasping vines over the moldering ground, entwining little broken fingers. Fungi, both plain and spectacular, break through the squelched mulch of the forest floor, puffing out clouds of choking spores. In this realm, the stems of half-demonic plants wave on their own accord, unstirred by the insect-choked air. Human-featured beetles walk along the banks of sluggish, muddy rivers. Reeds rattle, whispering the names of the poxes inflicted upon the worlds of mortals, or lamenting those that have died from the caress of their creator. 
There is a house of decay at the center of Nurgle's realm. Its racked and twisted structure creaks and groans under the influence of the baleful toxic winds. Shutters cling just barely to windows framed only half filled with broken panels of filth covered glass. Sewage drains spill forth beetles, maggots, and twisted centipedes with only tongues for their bodies and human fingers for legs. Paint continuously cracks and peels away from the wood beneath, yet the house never loses its gray green hue. Along the roof, hundreds of chimneys bellow out dark clouds that upon closer inspection are composed of millions of floating, buzzing flies. All around this house, trees made out of bone bear fruit that rot even as it swells. Leafless bouts of these ancient trees provide shelter for demonic birds that sing the funeral dirges of any unwelcome visitor. It is a house of pestilence, rot, and death. This is Nurgle's mansion, and that means that it is also a place of hope and renewal. There can be no explanation for the strength that keeps this structure from collapsing, except that it is a dwelling place for the Lord of all, whose boundless energy, sense of eternal purpose, and limitless joy for his work finds perfect peace with the inevitability of decay. Within his mansion of tumbling walls, Nurgle toils. Beneath mildewed and sagging beams, the great god works for eternity at a rusted cauldron, a receptacle vast enough to contain all of the oceans of the worlds. Chuckling and murmuring to himself, Nurgle labors to create contagions and pestilences, the most sublime and unfettered form of life. With every stir of Nurgle's maggot-ridded ladle, a dozen fresh diseases flourish and are scattered throughout the stars. From time to time, Nurgle reaches down with a clawed hand to scoop a portion of the ghastly mixture into his cavernous mouth, tasting the fruits of his labor. With each passing day, he comes closer to brewing his perfect disease, a spiritual plague that will spread across the eternity of the universe and see all living things gather onto his rotting embrace. Dwarfed by their mighty lord, a host of plague bearers are gathered all about Nurgle, each chant sonorously, keeping count of the diseases created, the mischievous Nurglings that have hatched, and the souls claimed by the Lord of Decay's putrid blessing. His hum drowns out the creaking of the rotten floor and the scraping of the ladle on the cauldron, so eternal in his monotony that to hear it is to invite madness. When not at his cauldron, Nurgle himself often sits in a massive chair just outside of the mansion's front door. From there, he entreats visitors both summoned and unexpected to approach, share tales and questionable libations, and explore the countless rooms within. Inside the vast structure, a guest could easily become lost. Rotten floorboards send many to their doom of a slow consumption by the carrion feeders that dwell in the lower levels. Grand staircases decorated with moth-eaten rugs beckon to a wandering soul, leading them to chambers where demons are glad to receive new, fresh flesh. Should the guests bypass these rooms and continue upward, they might find their way to the attic or Nurgle keeps samples of his works of decay, cataloged and counted over and over again by attendant plague bearers. In this attic are jars containing the viscera of plague victims from across time and space. Souls are trapped within apparently simple glass containers, left to slowly dim and fade as the maladies of the spirit waste them to the bone. If the visitor walks past the stairs and pushes deeper into the mansion, they might stumble upon the kitchen and the larders of the Plague Lord's home. Every foul ingredient, every pestilent component imaginable rests on the shelves here, neatly labeled and ready to be combined in the Great Cauldron. A wise guest will move on quickly from here, knowing that to linger is to become flavoring for the noxious stew, for this cauldron is among Nurgle's prized possession and he likes to keep it full. Nurgle is a creative being and he will take inspiration for experimentations where he finds it. Seldom can he resist the temptation to add nearby visitors to his virulent concoctions. This also goes to show how Nurgle is unlike any of the other ruinous powers, including how he views his domain within the realm of chaos. Korn, for instance, rarely leaves his throne, barking orders to his generals from atop his mountain of skulls. Slanesh watches the happenings of his kingdom from within his palace of pleasure, or wanders the universe seeking to tempt mortals into giving up their souls to satisfy his hunger. Zinj seems not to care much at all of the state of his warped and fractured land, spending his time plotting and interfering with affairs in realms beyond his own. Nurgle, on the other hand, cherishes the beauty and the surprise of his garden. He routinely takes strolls down its twisted paths, speaking with his demons and stopping to observe one of the many diseases take its toll on a wounded captive. Nurgle is in touch with his land and its many regions. 
In his wandering outside of the mansion, he passes by some of his favorite places, many of which have existed since Nurgle first thought of them and are likely to be the models for the reborn universe that is to come. A moment's journey from the mansion are the deathbeds, a place he visits more often than perhaps any other. It is a place that serves two purposes. Not only are wayward travelers and defeated invaders trapped here, stored in the deep pits and sucking muck of this place, awaiting some future foul use or their eventual demise, but it is here that Nurgle can indulge in one of his greatest forms of entertainment. The Plague Lord loves to hear the stories of the realms beyond his own. They inspire him to create new pestilences that are well suited to other lands, and in the deathbeds he has countless potential storytellers. Sometimes he offers these unfortunates the chance to improve their position by spitting the worms from their mouths and sharing the tales of their worlds with him. Those who amuse him sufficiently are plucked from the muck and removed to the mansion. There they have the great honor of becoming vessels to Nurgle's newest plagues. Once they have been properly infected, Grandfather Nurgle smiles, gives them one last tender gut-churning embrace, and sends them back into the lands that the stories described. After visiting the deathbeds, Nurgle often makes the poxyards the next stop on his stroll. It is here that he tests the efficiency of his contagions of the flesh and the spirit. Each malady requires a different set of trials to gauge its ability to achieve the Plague Lord's desires. This means that the physical form of the Poxyards changes to suit the task. For the test of this spirit, this region of the garden may be filled with crystal clear lakes. A dehydrated test subject may see these lakes and believe salvation is at hand, drink deeply of the cool water, and suddenly the water will turn to pus, tormenting the sick and weakening the soul. For a test of skin-eating diseases, the poxyards may be filled with claw thruster brambles. Infected captives will be sent running into the demon plants chased by beasts of Nurgle. If the captives scream as they pass through the razor edge branches of the plant, then Nurgle knows that the poor wretches can still feel pain, and his affliction needs refinement. No matter the incarnation of the poxyards, this corner of the garden always gives Nurgle new insights, and therefore he spends a great deal of time here. In addition to the mainstay regions of the land of the Plague Lord, there are many others that enjoy a less permanent existence, coming and going with the passing of one of Nurgle's many plagues. Some of these likely only exist in the nightmare visions and untrustworthy hallucinations of disease-ravaged minds. Still, the Garden of Nurgle is near infinite, and it is not so unbelievable that a recipient of one of Nurgle's great gifts might be blessed with the fleeting glimpse of one of the Plague Lord's realms. With their last dying breath, some mortals gasp and choke out words, saying that they can hear the faint bells tolling. Perhaps they refer to the blossoms that grow in the death bell lily fields. When a mortal dies as a result of one of Nurgle's many diseases, one of these pallid flowers opens up and emits a tiny chime to mark the success of Nurgle's handiwork. The hanging gardens of Thosh Bolg are a sight to be seen. This remote slice of Nurgle's realm was given over to the great unclean one Thush Bulk, as acknowledgement of his use of the Choking Plague to wipe out the orc infestation on Horax, a planet that Nurgle coveted. To commemorate his victory and to demonstrate constant thanks to his lord for his reward, Thush Bulg uses his own intestines to hang every single orc from the colony and the trees of his domain. There they dangle and rot, slowly dying but never quite finding release. In other places in the garden, plague bearers toss organs from the bodies of disease victims into sorting pools, making it easier for them to count the numbers that have died from each ailment. Beasts of Nurgle frolic in the fields where planted spines yield crops of dementia-inducing foodstuff. Nurglings crackle with glee as they roll down hillsides that form spontaneously when great unclean ones vomit up regimens that they consumed thousands of years ago. The land of the Plague Lord is a wondrous place filled with vitality, mirth, and the experience beyond mortal comprehension. It is a playground for the minions of the Lord of Decay, a laboratory for his works, and a conforming home for a god that knows his realm is the shape of things to come. The next twisted realm we're going to take a look at is the Domain of Zinch. Created from the raw energy of the warp, Zinch's realm is one of constant flux and shifting structures, created spontaneously from every material imaginable. Known as the Crystal Labyrinth, no mortal and few demons can visit the realm of the Raven God and survive with their sanity intact. Just as Zinch manifests and appears in many different guises, many of them fluid and shifting, so too the domain of the changer of ways within the realm of chaos constantly adapts to its master's whims, desires, moods, and of course the demands of his thousand and one plots. Humans, Xenos, and demons perceive and interpret this territory 
in a wide variety of ways. In fact, some scholars and a few of the more coherent first-hand witnesses who have survived contact with Zinch's realm have suggested that neither mortal nor demon except perhaps the more powerful lords of change, can grasp the true nature of Zinch's shifting realm. Most who visit the domain of the Great Mutator quickly go mad. Those of exceptionally strong mind and strong will can perhaps interpret but one facade of the often crystalline landscape that, like Zinch himself, has an infinite number of faces. Many commentators suggest that the mind can only perceive this world of warp energy created into something resembling solid form through symbols or metaphors, images created by the mind of the iron willed in an attempt to make sense of pure chaos and constant change. In fact, many witnesses rely on paradoxical metaphors even to describe the process of perceiving Zinch's realm itself, sculpting with fog, describing a dream as it occurs, singing silently, painting with mist and the like. The great ocean of the warp is a sea of madness and insanity, and Zinch's realm is a concentrated essence of such things given form. In spite of the constantly changing nature of the domain of the architect of fate, and the limited capacity of mortals' minds to perceive and comprehend it, certain common views have emerged from the extent descriptions of Zinch's realm. Some observers claim that the enormous crystalline labyrinth dominates the landscape, a luminescent plane shimmering like a polished molten opal. Passages in the maze appear, dissolve, merge, split, and change direction, seemingly at random. Those who gaze into the crystalline substances that compose this maze may see more than light reflected and refracted in the fluctuating facets of the shining surfaces. They may catch glimpses of fear, miseries, and hopes made visually manifest, dreams and nightmares, histories real and imagined, potential futures, images of torment, ecstasy, and despair, and through it all, an abstract thought made momentarily concrete as pictures in a crystal. One visionary reported seeing various images of his children at different points in their lives, all of them moments of despair, sorrow, and desperation. Another recounted her experience in Zincha's realm as one of ecstasy as she witnessed reflected representations of what she took as her possible futures, each more joyful and successful than the last. Yet another claimed to observe nightmare imagery in the mirrored surface of the labyrinth. Demons rending flesh from friends and loved ones, the destruction of his home by dark sorcerers wielding warp fire, and worst of all, the transformation of his own body into a tentacled, withering mass. When this last traveler was finally able to tear his gaze away from the hellish visions, he discovered that days had passed, and that his body had indeed changed to the hideous chaos spawn he had seen in his visions. Imperial records show that all three of these individuals met their tragic end. Suicide, insanity, and execution at the hands of the Inquisition, respectively. In one sense, these survivors of Zincha's realm were fortunate, and it is rumored that most who travel through the maze of the Raven God wander it eternally as miserable, insane shells of their former selves. Forever tormented by ghastly visions, regrets over their mistakes and missed opportunities, and the hope for a tomorrow that will never be realized. While the passage of time in the warp fluctuates and does not correspond to its regular linear flow in the normal four-dimensional space-time of real space, the inconsistency of time's progression is even more pronounced in Zinch's realm. In what seems like a few minutes spent gazing into the depths of the crystals of Zinch's labyrinth, days or even standard years can pass. Two individuals might enter Zincha's realm in the same instance in time. One might exit moments later and report that years have passed, whereas others could spend centuries of real time in Zincha's realm, but swear that he had been gone only for a few minutes. A single footstep may seem to take hours to complete, what seems like a few seconds spent admiring a beautiful refraction of light on the crystalline structure of the maze can take days. Many visitors, momentarily transfixed by some curiosity in Zincha's realm, have died of dehydration or starvation. Others can spend years wandering the insane corridors of Zincha's maze without drinking, eating, or resting, their metabolism apparently slowed by chaotic influence. Legends tell of an entity known as the Guardian of the Maze that inhabits the crystalline labyrinth. Though his name implies that he serves as the protector of Zincha's realm, 
he is set to function more as an observer and a gatekeeper. Rumors tell of a path through Zincha's realm that in theory, any mortal or demon may follow to discover infinite knowledge. To follow this path, the Inquisitive Pilgrim must travel through nine gates. These portals, three times the height of a man, appear as golden arches wreathed in blue and pink warp flame of Zinch. Such is the power of the Guardian of the Maze, or perhaps it is the bizarre temporal nature of Zinch's twisted realm itself, that the Guardian manifests as a giant, disembodied mouth hovering over all nine gates simultaneously. At each gate, the mouth ponderously speaks, asking those seekers of knowledge one of the 999 riddles of Xanathrox. Those who answer the riddles correctly may pass through the gates and continue along the path of ultimate enlightenment. Those who fail to answer correctly are doomed to wander the labyrinth for all eternity, wreaked with insanity and regret over the infinite knowledge that might have been theirs. Zinch's Sanctum Sanctorum, known as the Impossible Fortress, is said to lie at the center of the crystalline maze. If indeed geographical descriptions such as center apply with any accuracy to this inconstant realm. While this etheric edifice is in constant flux, many have described it as a crystalline castle composed of the same sort of material as the labyrinth that surrounds it. Inbalanced spires spontaneously emerge from the ever-shifting foundations of this impossible fortress, as do towers of blue and pink warp flame searing warp fire. Gates, doors, and portals slowly open as if yawning, only to slam shut like mouths of terrible beasts and then disappear. Mortals shackled by psychological manacles, forged by a lifetime of habit in the material realm, cannot fathom the perverse design of Zinch's home. As the name of this fastness implies, even the most visionary and heretical designers of the material realm cannot draft plans for this maddening architecture the impossible fortress deep inside Zinch's home. According to some profane accounts, lies Zinch's fabled hidden library. This infinite collection of tomes, scrolls, and parchments of every kind contains every scrap of knowledge and thought ever recorded in creation. Stories written and unwritten, histories true and alternate, and accounts of future potentials, actual and imagined. Many of the volumes are so weighty with knowledge that they gain a sentience of a kind and spend centuries chattering to passerbys, arguing with one another, rewriting themselves, and then reorganizing their placements accordingly. Magical chains of warp fire help to protect the books and bind them in place. Horrors serve as grotesque librarians and work tirelessly to reshelve the works, catalog the collections, and maintain what passes for order in the impossible fortress. As with so many things associated with a changer of ways, few things are always as they seem. Although the crystal maze, the impossible fortress, and the hidden library often appear as described, by no means are these descriptions consistent with every narrative provided by those unfortunate souls who have visited Zincha's domain. One of these unfortunate souls is Bach Zamael, dubbed the lunatic Scrivener of Havelock Prime by the Hive City's prince who acts as his patron claims to have traveled and returned from Zincha's realm in the early 41st millennium. Samayo attests that he saw nothing but a bleak hill on which a single, leafless tree stood. Another unfortunate soul, Dayless Dial, the heretic illuminator of Fallon 10, who was later executed for heresy, described Zincha's realm as a barren, desert landscape populated by deformed, headless humanoids that continuously split and reform into new bodies. Other witnesses have described a realm of pulsating and constantly morphing protoplasm, towers of fungus and mold, continents of sentient vegetation, and vines with unfinite length, and vast landscapes of nothing but barren stone and ash. It is likely that Zincha's realm is all of these things and more. Others have suggested that observers interpret Zincha's realm subjectively, filtering their perception of structured warp energy through their own expectations and experiences. It may be most probable that Zinch himself determines how each mortal or demonic individual perceives his realm to suit the needs, whims, and conspiracies of the master of lies. And finally we have the realm of Korn, the blood god. The dominion of Korn in the webway is a monument to fury and bloodshed. 
It is built upon a foundation of murder and conflict, and is home to every facade of battle and conquest imaginable. This blood-soaked realm echoes constantly with Korn's bellows and the clashing of weapons, the cracking of whips, and the clarion calls of innumerable brass war horns. Though the demon-filled battlefields of Korn's domain are many, and each is vast beyond reckoning, there is more to this blasted land than just blood-soaked plains populated with warring demons. Violence and despair are a constant traveling companion for any unfortunate soul cursed to briefly wander these lands. Each foreboding hellscape leads to another, more grim than the last, and at the heart of it all, upon a throne of brass, Korn sits atop a mountainous dais made of the skulls of his champions and their defeated opponents. Korn's gloomy chamber is lit by a great fire pit where dark flames consume the souls of the cowards who fled from battle. From the center of his realm, the Blood God watches over all his minions from his seat on the throne of skulls. From there he commands his legions to bring war to distant corners of the galaxy. Every victory he witnesses leaves him thirsty for more blood. With every defeat, he takes the blood of the failed champion and adds it to his rivers of gore. Surrounding the throne on all sides are mounds of skulls and bones. Champions and fallen enemies alike contribute to the mass of bones. Could these skulls speak? Some would tell tales before the long war against the corpse emperor of the Imperium, when the Primarch Angron had yet to swear his oath to the Blood God. Others would speak of grave mistakes that caused their entire race to fall to the axis of the legions of berserkers. The skulls closest to him, those of his favorite champions who have perished in service to their lord after hundreds of violent campaigns, would call out across eternity, screaming out their war cry, blood for the blood god. This haste-filled throne room sits in the center keep of a brass citadel, the Castle of Corn. Decorated with red vein marble, the metal walls of this unholy citadel are broken up by jagged outcrops, encrusted with blood and armored with spurs of blood-stained brass. Hideous gargoyles leer from every parapet, ready to spew scolding streams of fiery metal upon a besieger. This inner keep is protected by great black walls that make out the outer perimeter of the brass fortress. Upon the walls stand guardian demons with eyes as sharp as fangs and swords. They watch for any intruder ready to defend their master to the last. Within the walls, there are thousands of flesh hounds patrolling the skull yards, sniffing out the blood scent of any who dare attempt to intrude. In the skies, flying between the outer walls and the inner keep, elite bloodthirsters listen to the sounds of invasion in the wind. It is rare that any force mustered has the strength to assault the brass fortress, its guardians deterring all but the most foolish or daring of Korn's rivals from ever even trying. When the attempt is made, the might of the Blood God's personal host is brought to bear with a fury and rage that threatens to rip a hole between realms. While Korn's brother Chaos Gods could gain so much if they defeat him in his fortress, the risk of counter-invasion is too great. It is said that if Korn himself should rouse from his throne and personally go to war against the Dark Gods, his favorite blade would end them all in one mighty sweep. But such an act would have calamitous results that not even Zinch could predict. It is said that Korn himself was once consumed by so much rage that he took up his sword and smutted the ground, splitting it asunder for eternity. This fell sword is known by many names, including the War Maker and the End of All Things, and is capable of laying waste to entire worlds with a single blow. Because of this, an uneasy state of balance exists. When Korn does obliterate the invading armies of his brother gods, they do not exact retribution directly. When the threat is ended, neither does Korn press the advantage, but rather turn back towards his inner sanctum and reclaim his place atop the throne of skulls, thus his balance maintained in the eternal great game. Korn's great brass fortress is protected by a massive moat, not filled with water, but with the boiling blood of those who have lost their lives to war. Beyond this moat lies league upon league of cracked land, littered with the splintered bones of those who have fallen in battle. Packs of flesh hounds prowl these waits for intruders, skirting along the edge of the sea of blood, roving through the maze of crackling bone and tracking down any interlopers. The flesh hounds can catch the faintest scent of Korn's foes, even through the omnipresent stench of blood, and are merciless once on the chase. This blasted wasteland is split by a great crevasse, a canyon many miles long and bottomless. It is said that it is here where Korn struck his mighty sword and cracked his realm. Occasionally, the canyon of death fills with a tide of blood, which spills out over the plains and sweeps away the heaps of headless corpses and mountains of shattered bone in a tsunami of crimson as if the universe bled from some hideous wound. This forms thousands of rivers of blood that cut through Korn's land and end up emptying in this massive canyon, plunging downward in a waterfall of gore. 
The lake that forms at the base of the canyon is larger than any ocean in the mortal realm and populated with creatures that just cannot be. Leviathans of brass and bone swim through the lake and devour all as they pass. Soaring above the lake, bloodthirsters fight with dragons of pure solid blood. Those that stray too close to the surface of the lake risk being snatched out of the air by the very lake itself. So hungry is it for its carnage. Rising waves on the surface take the shape of warriors and do battle, crashing violently into each other and falling back to the surface in a rain of scattered blood. Warp energy, the raw stuff of chaos, constantly swirls across the Blood God's treacherous domain, where the power of the warp collects and stirs. Great craters are often gouged into the blasted plains. None can say if it takes moments or millennia for these pits to form, for time is meaningless in the realm of chaos. Eventually, the warp storm breaks apart, sometimes seeping into the very pits that they create. When this happens, Korn commands his minions to intensify their effort to harvest blood from the mortal realm, using the most violent and destructive and devastating methods that they can possibly bring to bear. The souls that perish in such a campaign give their blood over to a special dark cause. Their crimson essence is collected in a pit where it is mixed with molten brass and a measure of Korn's own murderous bile. The resulting lake is a new blood pit. It is from the blood pits that the new demons of Korn arise. Blood letters, furnace demons, and many lesser fiends steadily emerge from the warp and the bile-infused blood, ready to do their master's bidding. The soldiers that vomit forth from these pits will be charged from the day of their creation until the day they fail their master in combat, with claiming more blood to refill their pits. Eventually, a pit does go dry, but without fail, soon after it does, a new storm begins to brew, restarting the cycle of bloodshed. A chain of immense volcanoes constantly smoldering girdles Korn's domain. These form the Ring of Doom. Korn's roar of rage causes the volcanoes to erupt and the ground to shudder. The volcanoes then explode with the wrath of the Blood God, spilling out rivers of lava as hot as Korn's anger. On the inward slopes of these jagged, fire-tipped peaks sprawl the foundries of Korn. It is said that within these dire forges labor the souls of warriors who died in their sleep, forever doomed to serve Korn as slaves. Great stacks billow forth clouds of smoke, which mix with the fumes of the volcanoes to choke out the blood-red skies with industry of war. These grim edifices keep Korn's armories filled, his numberless warriors armed and armored by ceaseless toil. Here too, the components of Korn's demon engines are made. Assembly of these huge constructs of war is conducted elsewhere, but the cogs, blades, housing, and armaments all have their beginnings here, at the foot of Korn's mountains. It is a dangerous place to reside, even for the standards of the rest of the realm. At any given moment, a volcano could erupt, flooding the forge with molten brass. It is of no concern to Korn. If a few demons are incinerated in such a mishap, others will rise from the blood pits to take their place, and the forge continues. Despite the risk, the furnace demons are able to take advantage of the dangers of Korn's rage. The masters of the hell forges enslave the souls of those mortals who dare invade the blood god's realm and fuse them with the anvils of Korn. The tormented screams of those thus eternally in prison blend with the ringing and clanging of each falling hammer that strikes the forge. When white hot metal is placed on the anvil and pounded into form, the bound soul feels the scorching heat. Thus, as each new weapon or piece of armor is crafted in the demon forges, it is borne to the sound of Korn's enemies suffering his everlasting wrath. Here too can be found the pens of the juggernauts. Behind buckled and cracked walls thicker than any mortal fortification, the juggernauts of Korn are corralled. Such a godly stockade is needed, for no lesser barrier could hold at bay the fury of these demonic monsters. The titanic juggernauts constantly fight amongst each other, butting heads and goring each other to establish dominance. Legends tell of the demons and mortal champions that Korn has brought to this realm and who have dared to try to tame the juggernauts. The smash remains of nearly all of the warriors that have failed are smeared on the walls. Only a few of the bravest and strongest have ridden from the great brass gates atop the back of one of these murderous beasts. On the outward slopes of the volcanoes are immense parapets and bastions, carved from black granite. These tower miles into the sky, a daunting defense against any unwise enough to assail the kingdom of the blood god. Great infernal canyons await the command of Korn to unleash the fires of battle on the realm of the other gods. Mighty fortresses guard the brass battlements of the Ring of Doom, packed with Korn's bloodthirsty legions. With a single growl from Korn, these armies spill forth across the domains of the other gods to bring slaughter in battle. 
Under Korn's urging, these endless tides of soldiers are whipped into a bloody frenzy and will fall upon each other in their desire to spill blood if no other foe can be found. The domain of Korn is unlike any other. Each piece of the realm is fighting for dominance. Each acts as a living servant of Korn, wanting to prove to the master of the land that it is the most worthy for its reward. A visitor to this nightmarish realm would surely be driven mad, knowing that every rock, every breeze, and every drop of what would be water is an enemy looking to kill him with as much purpose as the demon inhabiting this land. Now those are the four realms of the Chaos Gods. One thing to keep in mind is that the warp itself is a lot bigger than this. Remember, it's not bound by time and space. Uh, so there are areas of the warp that are not controlled by any of these four Chaos Gods, but there's still demons and chaos entities uh, within them, or I should say warp entities within them. And we have a video for that. Um, if, you're gonna, if you guys want to learn about the chaos entities, I'll put a link up above. If not, uh, down in the description below. Um, also, if you guys have any any suggestions for any other topics of Warhammer 40k that you guys would like us to cover, let me know what it is in the comment section below. I'm going to be down there uh, answering questions, talking to you guys. Um, and if you guys enjoy this content, don't forget to subscribe, share with your friends, hit the like button. It really, really does help. And also consider supporting us on either Patreon, which is just a dollar a month, or uh, Super Thanks. Uh, it really helps out the channel. But thanks so much for listening, guys, and we'll talk tomorrow. This was Gersh1 with One Mind Syndicate signing out. <laughs>